So a lot of people want to build a gaming PC right now, but with GPU prices and availability being what they are, that seems like an impossible task. However, there is one potential option. The RX 6500 XT from AMD. I know, I know. It's received poor reviews across the board. It's had half of its features stripped from it and it's not even faster than an RX 580, which is a GPU that launched five years ago. That being said, right now it's the cheapest 1080p gaming GPU that you can actually buy right now. Uh, Newegg actually has a few of them for as low as 270 bucks, which is definitely higher than its 199 MSRP, but that markup isn't nearly as high as pretty much any other gaming GPU out there right now. So today I'm gonna build a dirt cheap gaming PC around this graphics card that's gonna set you back roughly $620, which by the way is cheaper than either the PlayStation 5 or the Xbox Series X right now, or at least what those are selling for at the moment. The question that we're gonna answer today then is, is this system going to be a viable option for gamers on a super tight budget? or is it simply gonna to cut too many corners in terms of performance and features to even be worth it? Before we continue, this video is brought to you by cdkeyoffers.com, a one-stop shop for reliable game and software keys. Right now, they're offering 20% off Windows 10 Pro OEM keys when you enter promo code BW20 at checkout. Getting your key is easy. Once you've added it to your cart, enter promo code BW20, fill out your payment info, and complete the purchase before heading to your purchased orders page to view and copy your new key. Simply paste it into the Windows activation page and voila, your operating system is fully authenticated. To grab your discounted Windows 10 Pro key now, click on the link in the description below. So the CPU I chose for this build is the Intel Core i3-10105F. This is a quad-core, multi-threaded CPU, so it's got eight threads. It's not the newest CPU, but it's not super old either. It's Intel 10th gen. It boosts up to 4.4 gigahertz. That's the max turbo frequency. And I believe the base clock is 3.7 gigahertz. The single-threaded performance on this chip isn't too bad, actually. I was looking at some reviews, and it's pretty comparable to the single-threaded performance of a Ryzen 5 3600. Multi-threaded performance, however, isn't the best. You're looking at more comparable to a Ryzen 3 3100. But I was able to purchase this on Amazon for just $89, which is half of what you would pay for a Ryzen 3 3100 right now. So we'll see how this checks out when we're playing some games. The MSI B560MA Pro is the motherboard I decided to go with. This is LGA 1200, so of course it does support the CPU that we're pairing it with. This is a very, very budget board. I'll actually kind of show it to you really quick. Super basic board. I think the two biggest compromises here are the fact that it only has two DIMM slots. So if you populate both of those, which we will be doing today, the only way to really expand your memory later on is to swap it out for a completely different kit that has higher capacity capacity per dim. The other not so great thing about this board is that it's PCIe Gen 3. And if you guys have seen any of the RX 6500 XT reviews, you know that performance definitely takes a hit on Gen 3 platforms as opposed to Gen 4. But seeing as how this is a super budget board, it would have cost us significantly more to step up to a Gen 4 board. I think I paid maybe about 90 bucks for this thing. It's definitely not ideal, but one of the big corners we have to cut here in order to get the price of this build as low as possible. Fortunately, I was able to pick up at least a 16 gigabyte kit of T-Force Zeus DDR4. This is a dual channel kit at 3000 speed. Eight gigs just wouldn't cut it. There's simply too many games out nowadays that eat up more than eight gigs of RAM. You're probably not going to be able to do much multitasking while you're gaming on just 16 gigs, but at least if you're just gaming alone, this should be plenty for our needs today. We also have a 512 gig SSD from Team Group. This is their MS30. It's just a SATA Rev 3, six gigabit per second drive. It is M.2, but no NVMe here. With a super budget build like this, there's really no need to spend extra money on an NVMe drive. You're not going to be leveraging those speeds that much anyway. And I think 500 gigs is a bare minimum starting off point for a gaming PC like this, at the very least, it's pretty easy to expand storage down the line. Our RX 6500 XT is the Gigabyte Eagle, and it's a dinky little card. It's got four gigs of RAM, as do all of the RX 6500 XTs, a single six pin power connector, no backplate, and a measly two video outs, display port, and HDMI. So at the very most, you'll be able to connect two displays to this system. It goes without saying that the graphics card is going to play the biggest role here when it comes to what kind of frame rates we're seeing, and once we jump into some games, we'll see if they're actually playable or totally abysmal. And finally, we have our case and power supply combo. This is the Apex TX606. It comes included with a 300 watt power supply. And if there's at least one somewhat decent thing about this GPU, the RX 6500 XT does not sip very much power. So you can pretty much run it on a 300 watt power supply. When I tested the power consumption of this card in my RTX 3050 review, the entire system was only pulling up to 220 watts from the wall. And that was with a, an Intel Core i9-12900K, which has a much higher TDP and much more power consumption than the Core i3 chip that we're gonna be using today. So 300 watts should be plenty 
company, even though it's sort of a no-name brand. In fact, why don't we actually take a quick look at it? What does it say here? Allied, Allied. 300 watts, no 80 plus certification or anything like that, which you wouldn't expect on a case like this. This was like, what, 65 bucks or something like that. 80 millimeter fan, pre-installed at the back, nothing at the front. We have a five and a quarter inch bay and some room for 3.5 hard drives. It actually has some ventilation at the front here. It's not completely closed off. The mesh does look pretty tight though. I wish it was a bit more open. I'm counting on the fact that uh, since these are lower powered components, our CPU and GPU will stay cool enough uh, in this chassis, despite its seemingly lackluster airflow. At least we have USB 3.0 ports on the front, two of them in fact, and uh, audio jacks, that's that's actually kind of nice. And fortunately we do have a USB 3 header on this MOBO. As always, I'll put links to all these parts in the video description, but I would highly suggest not purchasing any of them or building a system like this until we've tested it uh, to see if it's even worth it. I'm gonna put this system together right now and we'll see what it can do or not do. All right, the piece is done, the piece is done. Looking pretty good. Well, it's looking, it's looking okay. It's looking like, uh, it looks like a computer. <laughs> Not a not a great computer, not a fast computer. It's pretty basic, but I guess there's really not much you can expect aesthetic wise from a $600 gaming PC these days. That being said, it's functional. It's working. Windows 10 Pro, 64-bit, installed. It's running, it's, it's doing well, and we'll talk more about performance in a sec, but a couple things I wanted to cover about the build itself. First thing, I overlooked the fact that this power supply does not have a PCI Express cable. So I was like, oh no, we're not gonna be able to connect this graphics card because it's got a six pin PCI Express connector and it's not, it's not gonna work. But then I was like, wait, no, I actually have an adapter. So I used a, a six pin PCIe to dual Molex adapter that I happen to have on hand, thankfully. So add maybe five, maybe $10 to the total cost of this build to account for this adapter. Otherwise, obviously we wouldn't be able to use that graphics card. But fortunately, it worked out. The other thing to note here is that it only has a four pin cable for the CPU. And the motherboard obviously supports eight pin as you can see there on the connection. But that's fine. A single four pin cable is rated for 125 watts, which is more than enough to power our Core i3 processor here. So definitely a huge benefit that we're going low power, uh, low TDP, 65 watt TDP here as well for our CPU. Um, and uh, in case you guys didn't know, it works perfectly fine if you ever want to plug in a four pin CPU cable into an eight pin plug. It, it just it just works. Obviously, you'll have half the power going to the board, but if it's more than enough for your CPU, then you Gucci. Memory looks fine. Uh, at first, I thought these were heat sinks. These are not heat sinks. These are just stickers that are just slapped straight onto the dies. That's fine, whatever. We're not trying to overclock memory or anything. The last thing to note is that the cable for our front panel connectors initially did not reach the header on the motherboard, which as you can see is way over here to the left. Usually it's bottom right corner, unless you're talking about mini ITX boards uh, for the most part. Micro ATX, ATX boards, usually the connector or the header is on the right, but in this case, it's way over here to the left. Originally, the cable was routed through this cutout at the bottom, and uh, the cable had to sort of go in between the front panel and the frame of the case all the way down here, which significantly reduced the length of it. So I just rerouted the cable through the top hole, and that did the trick just fine. Let's talk about performance. I tested six different games at 1920 by 1080, and rather than run a bunch of built-in benchmarks like I typically do for GPU reviews, I decided to sit down for three or four hours and just play the games. It felt like the most practical way to see whether the gaming experience on this thing is even enjoyable. And I'm happy and kind of surprised to say it's not that bad. Obviously performance varies from game to game, which is why I tested a variety of titles starting with Overwatch. Like most other esports games, Overwatch is pretty easy to run, and I was seeing anywhere between 70 and 100 FPS at ultra settings, so the game looked great, and it ran super smoothly. There were no crazy frame drops, and the RX 6500 XT actually had plenty of VRAM to spare. The one other esports title I played was Apex Legends. Since this is a much faster paced game than Overwatch, I was a little concerned at first when I saw the lower frame rates while jumping out of the ship. But once I was on the ground, the FPS shot up, averaging between 100 and 130 FPS, and this was at max quality settings. Super fast speed and responsiveness, it just kind of made the rounds really enjoyable, even though it didn't make me any better at the game. It was kind of nice to see that a high refresh rate monitor wouldn't be a complete waste on this system. Those are just esports titles though. I might as well have tested Minesweeper. It's true, I started with the less demanding games first, but I eventually turned up the heat slightly with Halo Infinite. I jumped into some quick play multiplayer rounds and found that medium settings was the highest I could go and still maintain over 60 FPS on average, oftentimes getting well into the 70s, which makes this a very playable title on this PC. Even at medium quality, the game still looks fantastic and I never got the feeling that I was compromising too much here. However, I did try a big team battle round on a much larger map, which did drop the average frame rate noticeably, still averaging over 60 FPS, 
albeit there were more occasional dips into the 50s. Far Cry 5 is a game that's about four years old now, but it's still more intensive than esports games, and it does put a pretty hefty load on both the GPU and the CPU. Despite that, the system ran it with flying colors, averaging 60 to 80 FPS at ultra settings. Even though it requested the most VRAM out of all the games I tested, I was kind of surprised to see such good results at max quality. For the last two games, I really wanted to put the PC through its paces, so I fired up Control, which can easily bring a high-end system to its knees. I ran the game at medium with no ray tracing, because this card doesn't support it, and at these settings, ya boy was struggling to keep 60 FPS, averaging closer to 50 frames per second with dips into the 40s. I know, it's gross. Turning down to low settings though, bumped us up to a very respectable 70 to 90 FPS, but I definitely noticed a hit in image quality coming from medium. Surprisingly, this was the first time that I felt a big compromise had to be made with this rig. Having to choose between quality or performance is always a bummer, and we can't leverage DLSS to help with that, because this is an AMD card, obviously. It runs plenty fast at low settings, but having control look so crappy, especially when I know how great this game looks at its best, made this the most disappointing experience for me out of all the games I played. And then there's Red Dead Redemption 2, another title that smacks GPUs around like they owe it money. I found that one of the medium to low presets was the highest I could go and still maintain decent performance. Since this game has a ton of different environments in an open world setting, its frame rate swings more wildly than in other titles. I would see 80s and 90s in more barren areas, then down to the 40s in large towns like Saint Denis, which is bustling with textures. Fortunately, I was getting 70 to 80 FPS during outdoor shootouts, where most of the game's action takes place, and where high frame rates are more beneficial. At the settings I used, you can easily tell the image quality isn't 100%, it's nowhere near what this game's capable of with a top tier GPU, but it still looks a lot better than Control did at low. Control looks so lousy that it kind of distracted me from the gameplay. That wasn't the case for me in Red Dead 2. I played a handful of missions, killed a bunch of redneck outlaws, and had a really fun time doing it. Again, DLSS would have been really nice here though. A quick note about power and thermals. In all of my gameplay, the total system hit a peak wattage of 232 watts, which occurred in the Apex Legends main menu, oddly enough. The 300 watt power supply is enough for this PC, but not for much more than that. And any CPU or GPU upgrade down the line would most likely require a higher wattage PSU. Not to mention a PSU that has the proper EPS and PCIe cables for new components, which is definitely a drawback to consider with this particular system. The temperatures are good though, as you might expect. After nearly four hours of gameplay, the Core i3-10105F hit a max temp of 66C, while the RX 6500 XT topped out at 65C. Fortunately, there's not much more power in this rig, or else I'd be seriously worried about the case's single 80mm fan, but it's totally fine here. So let's quickly summarize the pros and cons of this build, uh, starting with the cons. As we saw in Control, some of today's more demanding games will need to be run at lower quality settings in order to run smoothly. And in some cases, like we saw in Control, the image quality really suffers. Also, like I just mentioned, this system doesn't really have a great upgrade path. If you were to swap out the CPU or GPU down the line for something more power hungry, more powerful, then you would probably need a new power supply. Also, you can't really expand the memory uh, in this system unless you completely swap out the kit because there's only two DIMM slots on the motherboard. So you would have to just replace both sticks with higher capacity modules. And the final main drawback of this system is the power supply itself. It's got some questionable reliability to it. Obviously, I don't have the proper testing uh, hardware to actually test to see how garbage or not garbage this unit is, but it's, it's a little sketchy. This is a 300 watt non-80 plus unit from Allied, a brand I've never heard of. If you were to build this exact system with this case and power supply, I would immediately start saving 50 or 60 bucks uh, for a decent 80 plus unit, or even better, just buy a different case and power supply from the get-go. Yes, it'll cost you a bit more up front, but you'll be better for it in the long run, and you'll have a case and PSU that actually lets you upgrade other parts more easily down the line. And then let's talk about the pros. Uh, there aren't many, but the ones that are here are, are, are pretty compelling. For starters, the system runs most games comfortably, over 60 FPS on average, esports games around 100 FPS, if I'm being perfectly honest, the performance of this system actually impressed me, and uh, I was expecting it to struggle a lot more than it really did. It's also cheap. This is cheaper than a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox Series X at the time of filming. You can buy this entire PC right now for the cost of an RTX 3060. It's depressing, I know, but it's true. The final pro here is that you can actually buy and build this PC right now. 
and I'm mainly talking about the RX 6500 XT. It's in stock, it's available, and it doesn't have quite as high of a price hike as most of the other GPUs right now. It's sad that we even have to consider this as a pro on this list, but it is what it is. So my final takeaway here for this build is, is this. If you can hold out until the market improves and the chip shortage is behind us, I would suggest you do that. You know, build the PC with the graphics card that you really want when the time is right, when prices and availability have normalized, although it's hard to know when exactly that's going to be. As they say, good things come to those who wait, but not everyone can or wants to wait. And so if you need or want a PC right now, and your budget is roughly six to seven hundred bucks, and you've determined for yourself that the pros of this rig outweigh its cons, I do think there's a fair case to be made for a build like this, especially in these trying times. But I'd love to hear what you guys think. Feel free to let me know if you think this build is worth it, if the price to performance checks out, or if you think the compromises are, are too great for this build for, for it to even be worth it. You know what is worth it though? The software keys you'll find at cbkeyoffers.com. Right now, the site has keys for Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition for over 50% off its normal price at just $15. Just one of the many everyday deals that you'll find on cdkeyoffers.com. To start browsing a massive library of affordable and reliable software keys, click on the link in the description below. Uh, feel free to blow up the comments down below, toss a like on this video if you enjoyed it, get subscribed for more tech content on the way, and I'll see you guys in the next video.